Hello, everyone. All right, so um, let's just uh, go ahead and start. We we had the recap of the keynote for, for those who may have been joining us. Um, you know, uh, we show the keynote at, was it 8 a.m. Uh, UK time this morning? So I'm guessing some of you were asleep then. Uh, but now it's time to uh, ask the experts. But before we jump into the questions, um, I just want to make sure that we can all introduce ourselves and just say a couple of words of, uh, about who we are, what we do at work, um, and especially for, for those of you from, from Microsoft, if you can share what your focus is. And then I think maybe Wee Young has uh, a couple of slides with uh, some news, so he can confirm that. If he does, he can go ahead and, and show those. Otherwise, we'll skip straight to the questions. So we can start top left. So uh, Wee Young, do you want to uh, say a couple of words about yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you to the team right, for organizing the event and for having us on the call. Uh, so my name is Wee Young. I'm the uh, group program manager for the Azure Data Factory team, together with Shirley Wang, uh, who is going to introduce herself. And uh, together we own the uh, Azure Data Factory PM team, uh, and it's also responsible for all data integration experience, whether it's in Azure Data Factory or whether it's in Azure Synapse Analytics. Uh, my team owns all the pieces uh, to make sure that you have a delightful experience. Who's next? Should we go? Do you want me to shout out? That easy. Yeah, go we on. can. Uh, we can jump to uh, Shirley. I think. Hey everyone, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Hey, my name's Shirley, and I'm co GPM Group Product Manager um, for the Azure Data Factory and Synapse Data Integration Team. So I run the PM team out of Shanghai and uh, very glad to be on this call. All right, and then um, Mark Cromer did a session uh, a couple of hours ago and I heard that he was driving in. He is not here yet, but if he is, um, he can jump in at any point. Um, we can move to um, Abhishek. Hello everyone, this is Abhishek. Uh, I work as a, prog a program manager in Azure Data Factory team, and I focus on CI/CD uh, and and security as well. Happy to, happy to be here. All right, Linda. Hello everyone, this is Linda Wong, and also the program manager from Azure Data Factory team. Thanks for having me here. All right, so those are our Microsoft experts here today. We also have a few people from the community, so we can start with uh, Raiz. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raiz Maif. I work as a data engineer. Uh, I'm currently employed at Almer's Pension Fund in Canada. Uh, I do enjoy working with data factories, so uh, uh, whatever I may gain as a as insights or the uh, some of the things that I, I was able to learn through, through the experience of developing the pipelines, uh, and I do enjoy sharing, so uh, uh, if I can be helpful for the, uh, to other people who are interested to learn about Data Factory, I'll be more than happy to share. Perfect. Leslie. Oh, you're still muted. Of course I am, because I'm going to be that person today. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone from Albuquerque, New Mexico. My name is Leslie Andrews. I'm a lead data architect at 3Cloud Solutions, and I'm really excited to be here today to share what I know about Azure Data Factory. Thank you. Camille. Hello, everyone. My name is Kamil Nowinski. I'm Group Manager and Analytics Architect at Avanat UK and, UK and I, um, and Data Platform MVP. Happy to be here. Thank you. Perfect, and I am so excited to have all of you uh, with us here today. I'm Katarina or Catherine from Norway, also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and I like to uh, speak and blog about both Azure Data Factory and Azure Synapse. Um, so before we jump into the questions, uh, Wee Young, did you have any slides that you wanted to share with some some news and updates? Oh yeah, sure. If it, I could just share one slide and then I'll switch back to this. Absolutely, I think you should be able to just uh, go ahead and share. Sounds good. Let me go ahead to share. Um, and then we'll get Mark to hopefully show those slides live. 
Yeah, so this is fresh uh, out from the oven. Um, and so I'll send a copy to you, Catherine, as well after the thing so that can share the community. Perfect. Sure. So can everyone see the slide? Yes. yes. Sounds good. So I think this is just one slide that captures uh, what is latest and greatest uh, since May all the way till today. Um, and in fact, you can find all the information about all the latest uh, innovations or product innovations that's happening in both Azure Synapse Analytics as well as Data Factory in the context of data integration uh, in the URL that's provided below, which is aka.ms slash ads slash blog. And just to pick a few uh, that might be interesting to the community, uh, and this has been some of the top asked questions so far. One of them is, of course, the ability for uh, one to be able to access on premises data store using the Azure Data Factory Managed BNet. So right now we've been working with the networking team as well as the community as well uh, to put together guidance documents and hopefully this is going to help you unblock some of the discussion that you might be having with customers on how you could then use the Azure IR in a managed unit to go all the way down uh, to on-premises data store uh, to be able to bring data into the cloud. Uh, other things that is there includes, you know, as us preparing for the managed VNet uh, GA, uh, we have been adding new regions. And so just as of last month, we added more than 10 plus regions. And as many of you in the community know, as we start preparing towards a GA, we have to make sure of that it's available in most of the major regions. And so this has started to happen. And the rest of other things that you see in the list, uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of them, is around some of the product innovations, whether it's on data movement uh, or data flows, which Mark shared uh, 6 a.m. this morning, uh, Seattle time, uh, across you know, how we get richer transformation with you know, introducing XML support into the past transformation and many, many more. But I think one thing that excites us a lot as well, uh, and I just want to call that out, and this will apply to both ADF and Synapse, is the whole notion that you know when you run a data flow and you will have data flow clusters <clears throat> that's doing most of the work, how do we enable you to get from minutes to seconds and so that you can just get your data flow really running really quickly? And so this is some innovation that's happened and we're going to continue pushing on the on the front. And in one other conference, someone was telling us why under five seconds, why not just instantaneous? Uh, that's a good feedback and we're definitely looking into it. So hopefully this one slide gives you a quick, quick uh, overview of what has been happening and then we can switch to the Q&A. Thank you, Catherine. Perfect, and I'm hoping that um, you may have some ideas. So if you're wondering where to ask questions, um, if we can get Mark to uh, switch back to uh, the one slide that he was showing earlier. At the top there, you should be able to see um, the Slack channel URL that you can go and join, and you can go use Slido, where you can just type in your question without logging in or anything like that. So once Mark gets that up on the screen, those of you who are watching can go to that URL, slide.do slash, and then that little short link, and just type in your questions. But we already have some questions um, lined up, so we can just go ahead and start. And there are um, a couple of people who are wondering about SSIS and the future of SSIS. So we know that SSIS, uh, you can run it from Azure Data Factory, but can you talk a little bit about the roadmap for or integration services compared to, you know, Azure Synapse, Azure Data Factory, um, and what uh, users can expect from that going forward. Hey, Shelly, do you want to take that? Sure, yeah, I can take a stab at it. So um, we have a very loyal um, set of SSIS customers who have over the years uh, built a rich collection of ETL logic. So, um, you know, as you will see uh, continuing forward, we are not going to stop investments in our on-premise uh, SQL Server and SSIS investments. Um, uh, I can't talk too much about the specifics, but you know, uh, we're not definitely not going to stop the in innovation there. At the same time, though, um, as customers are thinking about modernizing 
their SQL estate as well as their ETL workload into the cloud, we'll make sure to continue to allow the lift and shift story and make that smooth, uh, the migration path very, very smooth. Um, so you've seen some recent enhancements that we rolled out together with Azure Purview Public Preview in December, whereby customers can enable uh, lineage um, integration with Synapse. Um, and you know we'll do much more. We uh, our journey there is only getting started. Um, as customers are looking at on-prem SQL Server APS migration, um, you know Azure will be a great home for them, and we'll continue to enhance the assessment, the compatibility story, and make the uh, migration experience better and better over time. All right. Thank you. So we'll be jumping back and forth a bit here. I'm just uh, going to go through the list, list of questions that we have. Um, and someone is wondering about uh, data flows versus other ways of transforming data, things like stored procedures. So do you have any guidance on when to use data flows versus stored procedures and kind of um, some, uh, some tips for, for users on how to pick which one is the most appropriate one? Oh yes, uh, in fact, we have the expert here, uh, Apishek, right, who runs uh, all the external activities uh, in Data Factory, and he works very closely with Mark on some of the data flow uh, improvements. So let's invite Apishek to share about it. Sure. So we, and that's a great question. We do hear this from many cu customers as well. Um, so the idea is not to confuse them, but give them all these options. So for people who who want a visual transformations, there's no doubt uh, data flows is certainly the best option. So if you're looking for something visually transforming something, um, data flow makes complete sense. Um, and there's also a specific strategy with customers use. For example, if if the data warehouse or transformations that they want to do uh, can be pro can be done pretty much within the same database or data warehouse, stored procedures works pretty well there. And and of course the skill set matters as well. So if if the skill set being code centric and uh, things which needs to be done uh, is within the same database or data warehouse, then uh, it it makes sense to use stored procedures. But again, you have both these options. You have data flows, uh, and you can actually integrate now uh, stored procedures as well. You can make calls to stored procedures from within data flows. So there's integration endpoint there as well. So it all depends. We what we see is people who have a lot of stored procedures, um, historical stored procedures, and during the migration, uh, when they bring these onto Azure, they continue with it, but for the new stuff that they start doing, and that's where they start with data flows. So that's also a good idea to do with, and then uh, data flow now integrates with stored procedures, so you can have a good hybrid integration endpoints as well. All right, thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions that I think the answer is it depends because it's a little bit more on, um, you know, why are uh, things running slow compared to something else? And, and there could be so many, you know, uh, reasons for that. So I'm wondering if you can maybe um, give us a few pointers on uh, where do you go if you want to troubleshoot? What are the first things to look at? Um, what's the best way to kind of figure out how to optimize your pipelines and data flows? Sure. So, so today in Azure Docs, um, <clears throat> there's two. I'll say there's a few sections that might be interesting and useful to the community. One is uh, one member of our team. Uh, he's been spending a lot of time curating all the questions that are asked on support tickets, you know, within the community forums, and pushing it out as troubleshooting guides. And so many a times, if you design, for example, a Synapse pipeline or a Data Factory pipeline, and you encounter an error message. Uh, you can actually go to this troubleshooting page uh, and just look for the symptoms and what are the kind of possible suggestions or solutions. So that's definitely one piece to it. And then the other piece to it is really on performance tuning. Uh, whether it's, you know how should you be <clears throat> scaling up your self-hosted integration runtime? How should you even be thinking about getting a data movement or your copy to move at lightning fast speed, if you will? Or how do you get your data flow to be most optimal? Uh, and so we do have two guides. Uh, one of them is written by Linda and one of them is written by Mark. Uh, that actually takes you through a step-by-step -step guide on, you know, 
the approaches and the best practices for uh, getting out a baseline workload before you could then uh, scale it up to the big workload that you're expected to do. Uh, so those two guides are all available. And I think on the team and together the community and some of the discussions that we have offline, one of the things that we've always been thinking about is how can we make this better? Uh, for example, if you recall um, back in the sequence of the days, BPA or the best practice a performance analyzer was something that was really resonating really well, provided by the CAT team to the rest of the community. What is the equivalent in ADF and Synapse? How can we, you know, what, how should we even think about it? Uh, and so on and so forth. So those are the questions that is top of our mind. And, you know, like if there's any suggestion, feedback uh, from, you know, other experts on the call, definitely do share about it, but at the same time, send us feedback because then we would be able to get that kind of, you know, making sure that not only do you have the docs to support you uh, from a guidance perspective, but even baking into the product on making your experience better. Right, thank you. So some great guides there that you can go and look at if you have specifics on troubleshooting and performance. Um, so we have a, a question for, for multiple panelists, and I think I'm going to send this over to our community experts and, and hear your thoughts on this. We can start with um, on the screen here, bottom left, and then we can move to the right. I think that's an, an easy way to, uh, to go through this. Um, how did you decide whether to use Data Factory or Synapse, or how would you uh, recommend one product uh, versus the other to people that you talk to? So when would you use Synapse versus Data Factory? And um, uh, kind of what would you guide other people to choose? I, if I can continue first, uh, um, I think it all goes down to the actual um, data sets that uh, a customer may be working on uh, in terms of like uh, making a decision whether I would uh, totally rely on the on the synapse with the whole ecosystem with uh, uh, defining data sets creating the the pipelines and then uh, define how this um, data sets can be analyzed uh, but if the data set is really specific and it doesn't cover some of the it doesn't cover most of the use cases then then, then maybe just a pure data transformation path, um, uh, which is nest in this case, um, uh, a very simple set of pipelines can be used. In this case, uh, I would I would suggest just rely on the on data effect itself. I also, I would echo what Abhishek has said that like whenever uh, decisions, decisions are made uh, in terms of whether I would rely on a, on a data factory uh, Data flow specific to create uh, my da uh, data transformation logic, or rely on this on 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the, say a particular case with this, uh, with the SQL Server procedures. Uh, if it's a mi migration project and then the, uh, a part of migration becomes uh, to bring the on-prem server into the Azure, yeah, then then it, it makes total sense. Like the, the the core functionality of the store products can be easily reused, and then uh, with uh, almost no uh, well, little effort, little efforts to migrate them. But if it's a net new project, yeah, then let's go and reuse just for the data transformation. And let's use the data factory uh, to create uh, my data transformation. But then, um, then with um, maybe one more comment. Then with all the net new projects, um, there's a new. Um, Sometimes not visible narrative that, that, that comes along as well. Uh, the 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 cost, like uh, the customers have done, they don't realize that that's even just running some of the very basic uh, control flows, like in data factory, it's a cost uh, uh, for the customers. And then when they try to bring, oh, let's create a data flow, that that's an additional cost as well. And if we try to improve, like uh, what we almost was saying, uh, let's say in terms of the, the performance if we try to spin up some of the just uh, like the more expensive cluster that will be that will make an effect to the overall cost of the solution so there's always a balance like it's it's all uh, um comes to first to the data set that i would try to work with in terms of my initial sourcing data set and then what the uh, the destination let's say use case for those uh with with data with this data um, at the end and also with the overall expectations how much uh cost I would provision like how much budget I have for for uh, for work, and then what is the overall idea of whether it's a migration project or whether this is a net new project, and I would just make decisions. So it's it's always a a decision based on multiple variables. I would say. Leslie, do you want to jump in? Do you have anything? Sure. So like. 
like we all said, it depends, right? It depends on, on what you're doing and why you're doing it and what the outcome is. Um, sometimes as the, the consultant sent in to do the work as opposed to being the solution level architect, somebody else has already made those decisions for you and you're just being told, oh, this is what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. But I think that you can also, by understanding when it's the right time to use those things, make suggestions that you know could maybe float up that would save time, save money, because you, your understanding of the whole process and the whole project uh, can add to that. I will say that I think that if you're just doing a migration, you're just moving the data from, let's say, on-prem to the cloud without any need for anything else at any point, analysis, you know, um, the, the whole AI, the, ex, the visualizations, if all you're doing is moving data, data factory, it, that's what it's good at. You take the data from one place and you move it somewhere else. So that's what I have to add. Yeah, Camille. Yeah, there's there's many factors, but uh, what I would like to just add to this, uh, to what has been mentioned, uh, is that you know, uh, using signups, for example, you can you 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 can you you can have the the whole platform. Uh, was the one of the uh, good benefits is that you can uh, use uh, a lot of uh, services in one Azure Synapse, yeah. Uh, so, uh, for example, you can give uh, all the notebooks and and the, and the uh, work workspace uh, for you for your analytics team that they can play with uh, with the data. Yeah, or if you if you need uh, um, a data warehouse with MPP engine uh, behind the scenes, that's that's also your your place. So basically, having all in one place, uh, it's 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 a good benefit. Of course, there's some much much more than that, but uh, but that 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 the, 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 that the, those things that. They are not existing in the data factory, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's um, that's a good segue into uh, another question, which is um, a little bit on, um, you know, inside of Azure Synapse, you have all of these other things uh, that you can work with. You have notebooks, you have the data warehouse side, and um, I, I hear a lot of questions on uh, the cost and the pricing of this because uh, people have heard that Synapse is the data warehouse part, that it's fairly expensive, and that I think some people are worried that if they only do the pipelines and data flows, the data integration side of it, that it's going to be more expensive. Um, so do any of you from, from Microsoft, um, can you just um, explain that a little bit more from the, the cost perspective uh, versus the different uh, products and capabilities that, that you have? Oh, yes. Uh, Shelly, are you taking this question? I'll try. Um, so, I'll try myself. Right, so <laughs> sure. Started. Yeah. Um, please do add on. Um, so Synapse, just like all the other Azure Data Services, uh, we're really building it in a serverless way, uh, which means that, you know, for for example, uh, SQL Pool on Demand uh, for Spark, as well as for all of the Synapse data integration capabilities, the compute underneath is provisioned on demand. Uh, there isn't a reserved compute that you have to to pay for, um, even when it's sitting idle and not doing useful work. So we're really embracing the serverless notion and make sure that it's a pure pay as you go. So as you navigate and compose your solution within Synapse, um, it's pretty much, you know, you pay for the capability uh, piecemeal, you pay for the duration um, in a pure uh, pay-as-you-go manner. So, for example, if you have run uh, SQL on demand, then you pay for the duration, and as, uh, I think it's per GB of data that's being queried. Uh, if you uh, utilize the Spark capabilities, then uh, similarly, you pay for the core compute as, as well as the duration. And then uh, for the pipeline component and the data flow, um, as you know, it's the same model and the same charge model, same price point as standalone ADF. So the orchestration, the data move, and the data flow capabilities um, is the same uh, as you're familiar with in standalone ADF. So it really depends on which component uh, and capability you're using and you pay for that piece. So we hope you want to add more. 
Oh yeah, I, I just want to add on uh, and plus one to what Shirley said around making sure that you know whenever you're doing data integration on Azure, whether you're using an Azure Data Factory or you're using an Azure Synapse Analytics and take advantage of all the other amazing capabilities in Synapse, we want to make sure that the pricing is the same. Uh, and therefore, you know, like if there's any situations when you're working with customers and you see that why is there a difference in pricing uh, or you need clarity in that, definitely reach out to us because uh, that could be something that could make, might have fell through the cracks and is an area of improvements for us. But in principle, we want to make sure that it's exactly the same price. Uh, and of course, subjected to the different regions in where it is deployed. Um, and so definitely reach out to us on that. And I think the other thing is we felt like this whole notion of, you know, not having to manage the kind of infrastructure for you to be able to do data integration and be able to uh, pay as you go is so, so important. And so we're definitely striving continuously, right, to uh, make it easier and even make it more uh, cheaper for you to do it right so one of the things earlier this year that we launched uh, is the reserve instances for data flow and so between a one year to three year reserve instance you can actually get up to about 30 percent discounts uh, and so we're continuing striving to make sure that it's the most cost effective tool but also the best tool for you to do data integration on the Azure. yeah Right, thank you. I'll um, quickly try to summarize what has been said for, for those who are still wondering a little bit about the ADF versus uh, Synapse part of this. Um, like Leslie said, if you're only moving data, ADF could be a good choice. Otherwise, you might want to start with Synapse. And if you're only doing the data integration side, there are no additional costs for using Synapse versus ADF. The additional cost comes if you start using the other services like serverless SQL with the additional benefits that you have there. So I hope that cleared it up for, for some of you. Um, I think we'll move into a question that is a little bit more uh, technical. Um, a few people have asked about queuing. So the question here is, um, in one of our projects, we see completely different queue times. Could you elaborate about the reasons why some pipeline runs are starting faster and some are not? Or talk a little bit about the queuing concept and uh, what that is? Sure, I can take this one. So uh, when you see the queuing time, it actually uh, relates to what kind of the operations and uh, you are using uh, with the pipeline integration, and also uh, what kind of the integration runtime you are using to empower those operations. So one of the most common cases that we, we see from customer when they observe that var uh, queuing time variation is uh, they're using the self-hosted integration runtime to empower operations like uh, data copy, uh, et cetera. So when you use the self-hosted integration runtime, uh, given the IR is uh, you provision some infra, which will run those uh, activities. So there it will be a capacity that determined by the IR stack. And also we will determine based on how many IR nodes and what is the IR stack to determine how many concurrent runs that can be run on that self-hosted IR. So in that case, if you observe uh, queuing time variations, one of the suggestions is you can uh, go to the IR monitoring. So on the uh, uh, ADF portal or Synapse portal, you can uh, see that on each of the uh, self-host IR, the monitoring page, you will see that how many activity runs uh, happened on that given IR and what is the average queuing time, uh, what is average queuing drops that uh, happened against that IR. So that will help you understand or monitor uh, the IR capacity and we also provide guidance on how to scale out or scale up those IRs if you have more concurrencies that the current import cannot really empower those jobs. So the self-host IR is the uh, most common case that when the queuing time happens and when if you are using the Azure IR which is fully managed AD, uh, resource provided by the ADF that uh, usually the, the, the job or the activity run will start just in seconds or a few minutes. Uh, that is the fully managed and serverless info that uh, provided by the uh, ADF service. So usually the queuing time should be uh, quite short there. Hope that right. helps clarify. Hopefully. Um... It's, it's a little bit difficult to uh, to have these sessions when we can't see the people who are asking the questions, but hopefully if uh, you need to follow up on something, again, just go to uh, Slido, type in your, your question, and we'll try and answer that. Um, 
so over to uh, another another thing, and I think I'm going to call out uh, Abhishek and, and Camille on this. This is on deployment and CI/CD, and I think that you two are uh, probably the expert one from Microsoft, one from the community. Um, so maybe um, Camille, maybe you can talk a little bit from the community side first on the whole CI/CD experience. And uh, I know that you have been doing a lot of work on that side, so you can maybe uh, share a little bit about that. And um, uh, is there a way to, or how would you implement CI/CD and uh, the tools that you would use? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so CI/CD. If we're thinking about the CI/CD Azure DevOps and how to how to automate deployment of of, uh, of Azure Data Factory, it, it was not trivial, and and people still were were complaining about how to do that. It was not it was not easy. It was not uh, clear, and etc. Uh, so if we're talking about um, the automation, first we, we we have to think about what is the what is the source of the code. So so uh, we have to understand that. Um, there's actually two ways of uh, deploying uh, the things, yeah? So the, the first way is to automate uh, everything and deploying using the standard uh, approach like you use in the in the whole cloud, in the whole Azure, uh, using ARM templates. So you can you can publish uh, something from Azure Data Factory from UI, for example, and it goes to the ADF publish branch, a separate branch creating or updating ARM templates in there. And then, uh, you know, in your release pipeline, you can, um, uh, Create and deploy that ARM templates um, to the to the target instance of Azure Data Factory, whether it is uh, one or the other environments or or stage. Yeah. So, but at the beginning, actually, you 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 have to set up the Git repository, and this concept is not very well uh, not very familiar for uh, for many people yet, unfortunately. Um, but we are closer. Yeah. So I think so. For, for first problem is that even if you set up the Git repository, um, then uh, the the ARM template is creating in separate branch. That was the, the first difficult that people faced. And the second uh, problem was that people basically couldn't automate the whole thing, uh, you know, because there was only one manual step in the UI, uh, which thankfully has been changed uh, at the beginning of this year. And now you can automate everything. I will describe it in a, in a minute. So the, the, the second approach is you can do, if you have everything set up in your Git repository, you can directly deploy Azure Data Factory from, from the code. Uh, so um, to do that, you, you need to just use the REST API or, or, or use uh, AZ uh, dot um, data factory uh, PowerShell module. So I uh, created like one or one and a half year ago, I created another PowerShell module that helps you uh, to generate, uh, sorry, not generate, uh, deploy everything uh, from the code, from directly from code perspective. So that allows you, for example, um, doing selective deployment, for example, which is not possible when you're using uh, a deployment from ARM template because ARM template using uh, everything or nothing. Yeah, you can deploy just everything. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of pros and cons of both uh, approaches, but that's not, not the point. Basically, you can choose one on or, or the other. Uh, the What is uh, the most important thing that now, since this year, actually, I actually this from since uh, December 2020, Microsoft created another step, another library that helps us to automate the whole CI CD process, which is the NPM package that you can reuse to automate the last um, uh, the, 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 the last bracket that was uh, missed. Uh, yeah, so you can instead of cl cl clicking the publish in the in the UI, you, you can now automate this CI process, this uh, continuous integration uh, process and automatically grab what has been changed in the Git repository uh, and automate this export of RM template to, uh, to actually to artifact. You don't have to even use uh, um, uh, ADF publish branch, which was which was uh, also very difficult for many. Um, so uh, using this NPM package, you can you can automate this step and actually in consequence, you can automate the whole uh, process. And I've created uh, if you if you try to find out in the Google or in the Twitter ADF tools, you can find a PowerShell module that helps you, you know, deploying everything, uh, the whole Azure Data Factory instance uh, from from the code, or even you can uh, find uh, in the market in Microsoft uh, Azure uh, DevOps Marketplace, you can find the tasks that uh, you can very easily use 
as a one step and um, deploy the whole Azure Data Factory uh, to the to the target uh, instance to the target um, uh, ser server uh, resource group. Let's say yeah. So. The task allows you create, uh, you know, uh, Azure Data Factory. If that doesn't exist, it uh, do it does a lot of step for you, like uh, stopping all the triggers, starting all the triggers, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't want to spend too much time and bore you uh, with the, all the all the features, uh, but uh, that now you can you can basically automate everything. That is great, and and maybe we can hear from uh, from Microsoft as well. Um, is there anything you can share about maybe more on the roadmap side? Is there anything you're working on um, that can also help people? And and maybe especially, I know uh, for me, I was not familiar with code and tools and um, how to kind of make that process a little bit easier for those who are hard new to that. Sure. Yeah, I can share. Um, that was a great. Uh, summary from uh, Kimmel on, on the CICD story. So thanks for that. Um, and as he summed up, so I'll just get into some of the things that we, there, there's still areas that we need to improve. A uh, couple of areas which Kimmel mentioned is we certainly deploy the ARM templates today. Uh, and even though the NPM package is good enough to um, deploy code from your branches, so it can actually generate an ARM template from a single branch that you're working on, which can dramatically reduce the the size of the ARM template. It can have only, you can think of it as, as the pipelines that you're working on, but there are still a bit of challenges here and there, and you know customers do ask us uh, the ability to configure or decide which artifacts should be treated as code uh, and which artifacts should be treated as, I would say, infra, uh, or maybe less, uh, they, they don't want it to be part of the same CI uh, releases. So the things which we'll work on um, in 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 the coming days um, is is around defining the artifacts well, letting customers choose what artifacts they want to define. So you will see more customizations coming in in terms of uh, customers selecting different artifacts, uh, and some artifacts will not be part of their um, deployment cycles today. That's not an option because we create an arm. Uh, a single arm and so there will be improvements on those sides um, in the coming future and I think just to add on in terms of synapse uh, the automated publish feature should be released really soon so it's coming up soon as well so in ADF we did that NPM package and the same is going to come through in synapse I'm not sure if it's released but it's going to be very very uh, soon as well great news there um I think we can uh, make a little jump to a different question again, and it's a little bit on uh, data flows. Um, some people are wondering because you hear that data flows, it's running on a cluster behind the scene. Um, when would you use data flows versus Databricks? Now I know there are two very different products, but can you uh, kind of summarize that and explain what they are and how they're different? Yeah, sure. So I can take that question. I one thing that we all might have seen right in the industry is that movement be towards low code no code and especially for many of us that could have started from the exercise days or using many of these etl tools uh, we are very used to this kind of uh, no code approaches of designing data pipelines and i think that is actually an area where uh, data flow was shine uh, where you could just you know drag and drop with your boxes and your lines, you are now able to describe a very complex data pipeline that's not just moving data, but transforming data. And even back then, the exercise days, one of the dream that we always had on the team was, you know, how can you just specify the intent of what do you want to transform, where do you want to move it from, and let the underlying system or infra, if you will, take care of figuring out how do you run this at scale. And by scale, this could be terabyte, this could be petabyte scale uh, on a compute infrastructure that is naturally scalable. And so I think that is one of the philosophy that we design data so far, which is a low, low code or no code approach towards data integration. And I think that itself, uh, and for many of us on the call, uh, we all get very excited by it, but what we can achieve with it. And I think the other thing, of course, we've seen is that there's also data engineers, you know, that has, or even big data experts that has been writing considerable amount of Python code 
uh, that runs on the Databricks cluster. And our philosophy there is that if you choose a code first approach, we should not ask you to say, hey, overnight convert it to data flow because sometimes it's not possible or practically makes sense. And those situations, we want to make sure that we can help you orchestrate it, but at the same time, leverage some of the other capabilities that's in data flow. Uh, and in fact, if you look at some of the LinkedIn or some of the blog posts uh, that's available out there, uh, not just about data breaks, there was also a, what we call ISV, uh, that operates both in the Seattle as well as in the Europe area, where they have been working on Apache pick scripts for a really long time. Uh, and over the past one and a half years, they actually went through this transformation to take all their pick scripts and turn it into data flow. And right now they're loving it because the time taken for them to now describe a complex pipeline uh, and making sure that it is easily maintained uh, is so much better. And in fact, it's a public code that they have shared uh, and we're really thankful to Tom, who is the CTO of the specific group, uh, for sharing some of his experience as well. So hopefully that helps, Catherine. Yeah, and I can um, kind of shift that question over to uh, to Leslie. I, I would love to hear a little bit from your perspective um, and for others who might be getting started. Um, is there anything that you've noticed in uh, whether it's Data Factory or Synapse when working with pipelines um, that has been easier for you in this tool than in previous tools you have used? Um, or is there anything that you've done in Azure Data Factory that has been uh, ha has anything given you that moment of oh wow, this is this is really cool? Cool. this is really nice and easy to do. Um, I, I, I want to say that from, from, a, from a user's perspective, the data flows have really added a robustness to data factory that, that I think that those of us that come from an SSIS background were kind of like, really, I can't do some of these things that with S, within SSIS I thought were pretty basic common tasks and then when the first few uh, iterations of data factory came out and you're like huh you mean i can't really do some of these things and then we get to data flows and that i think really has enhanced data factory to be a place where you can do the transformations that you're used to uh, from ssis in that no code solution right the drag and drop being able to do it and that like you were asking what's super cool that was super cool going into the data flows and being able to put those together and build them and and really be able to get back to that feeling of i can do really cool stuff now in data factory that i used to have to oh i have to go back to ssis to do that because it doesn't have these these things and so i really think that it's just um improved the product to a point where it, it can really become a high available product for an entire enterprise to use to move their data around and get those those data sets created where they're usable to the users because that that's really what we're trying to get to here is a set of data that is in a prime condition for everybody to go to to get whatever it is that they need whatever your organization's trying to do analysis on you want that golden data set that everybody uses so that all the answers anybody ever gets are the same and if you if if you've planned that and you're using data factory i think it's really gotten to where that's that's not an insurmountable goal for a data team i think that that's something that pretty much every enterprise level or even small business level could could get to by using these tools right thank you so i see that uh, our time is almost up. Um, it's been a pleasure having you all here and uh, thank you so much for, for spending that time with us. I'm going to ask one more question of uh, from Microsoft. Is there anything on the roadmap or anything that you're working on that you can share with us that you haven't or, or can you give us some hints on something that's coming up? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I can take that. I think one thing that we wanted to, uh, you know, share the community is that data integration experience on Azure, uh, whether it's ADF or whether it's Azure Synapse in Analytics, uh, we have a commitment to make sure that we continuously push the envelope and making sure that it's the best experience. So I wanted to start off with that. And I think over the summer, in fact, uh, the next six months is going to be really exciting. Uh, one thing that we are really excited about is we're going to continue pushing uh, 
and you know the team has been working hard and kudos to the engineering team for doing that on pushing managed vnet to ga i think that's top of mind for a lot of this kind of enterprise conversations uh the second thing that you would also see is power query experiences in both adf and synapse how can you you know leverage power query to be able to use an excel like interface uh, or an interface that many of us in the power community loves be able to again describe how you want to do your transformation but more importantly, be able to take that and turn it into data flow that you can continue to enhance, but running this at amazing scale. Uh, that's something that over the summer, we're gonna make the experience uh, even more better. Um, and so I think top of mind, those are the two things that is upcoming. And then, uh, on top of this, we'll continue pushing out, you know, more connectors uh, that will then allow you to connect to any kind of data sources that you have, whether it's on-premises, the cloud, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that, I, th those three items would be something that you know in the summer you expect significant kind of uh, improvements on, but more importantly, uh, making them available as GA. Wonderful. So thank you all again. Thank you for spending time with us and sharing your uh, insights with us. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day or evening, whether you're here or there. Um, and I will talk to you all soon, and then I'll hand it back to you, Mark. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Catherine, for hosting the session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Catherine. Thank you, everyone. That was great.